Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our first fall 2023 seminar for the Muscle Health Research Center. It's a uh, privilege and a pleasure to introduce Dr. Russell Heppel, who will be joining us in just a moment. Um, and he'll talk to us about his data on alterations in skeletal muscle mitochondrial function with aging in relation to muscle fiber type. Dr. Heppel is world renowned for his contributions to muscle physiology spanning aging and exercise and so and uh, related conditions and also world renowned for his expertise in mitochondrial functions. And I can certainly attest to that, um, not just by what's obvious in the literature and his uh, participation in a lot of conferences around the world and, and, and uh, but also personally as a researcher, what we've learned by talking to him over the years. And uh, he is at the Department of Physical Therapy and College of Public Health and Health Professions at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And we're very much appreciative of his time uh, to share with us his exciting data. And so on that note, um, uh, thank you very much for coming, uh, Russ. And uh, please, please uh, share your screen. And uh, let's make sure this is all going OK. It looks great. Hey. And there we go. Thank you very much and really looking forward to your talk. And I'll hand it over to you. All right. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, so I just want to start by saying thanks to uh, Dr. David Hood and, and Chris Perry for the invitation to speak with you today. Um, the photograph that you see here, I actually did take. <laughs> so I see gators on campus quite regularly. Um, this is from uh, sometime in the spring this, this past year. Um, at any rate, what I've been tasked with uh, today is to speak with you about alterations in skeletal muscle mitochondrial function with aging and how this relates to fiber type, so muscle fiber type. So I, I just want to start by acknowledging uh, my collaborators. Uh, Terrence Ryan, in particular, has been really instrumental to helping us get a lot of the recent work going that you'll see towards the end of today's talk. And then the last two uh, folks on, on the collaborator list here, Michael Cohen, he's from uh, the Oregon Health Sciences University. So he's a chemist and he's actually making a lot of really fascinating compounds that some of which we are fortunate enough to be able to use in the lab. And uh, Dennis Wolin from the Scripps Institute in uh, La Jolla is also making some compounds that you'll see towards the end of the talk. Um, trainees, Great crop of people right now. Uh, you'll see Maya Samel. She's just a brain right now. <laughs> I haven't got a photograph of her yet. She's that new. Um, but uh, and there's been a host of other folks who've been involved in this work uh, over the years. So I'll, I'll be highlighting them as we go. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, our funding bodies as well. So with that, I do want to say that it's great to be a mitochondriac. And for those of you who don't know what a mitochondriac is, it's a biochemist or a physiologist, in my case, with a chronic and unusually intense interest in mitochondria, and I definitely fit that bill. And not only do I fit that bill, but I'm married to another mitochondriac, and we have a nice little photograph here from uh, the Swiss Alps, and we're wearing matching mitochondria t-shirts. How's that for geeky for you? Okay, so with that said, what yeah. I'm going to talk about... Sorry, Russ, are you still on the, the first slide with the alligator? That's all I see. Oh, No. Oh, okay. Sorry I'm about that. On. So it's not transitioning? No, that's interesting. I apologize about the delay. Just give me a minute. Let's see if yeah. we can figure this out. No, no problem. No stress. I went through my definition. Yeah, after you. And there, I wasn't lying. There is an actual photograph of me and my wife wearing matching mitochondria t-shirts. <laughs> okay, so sorry for that little hiccup. Hopefully we won't have any more as we go. So what I'm gonna talk to you about is fiber type and aging muscle, um, then segue into talking about how mitochondrial function changes between muscles of contrasting fiber type and how we can actually try to integrate some of the shift in fiber type that occurs and helping us use that information to account for what's happening to mitochondrial function. And then the last part is really the part that I'm most 
fascinated by. It's also the part that we still have the most work to do on. And that is how do these functional changes impact aging muscle? You know, that's the million dollar question. There's been no shortage of studies showing changes in mitochondrial function in aging in general and in aging skeletal muscle. But the real question for me is which of these changes are most important and how do they really influence muscle? Are they driving any of these aging muscle phenotypes? So with that said, let's look at muscle fiber type. So um, this is kind of a little bit of a, a, a poll, if you want, but I, obviously I can't see what people are answering. So you can just answer in your own head. And so the question I've got for you folks is, which fiber type is most vulnerable with aging? And so I, I imagine everybody's got an idea in their head of, of what they think. So, you know, an option is, all right, slow twitch muscle fibers. Is that is that one of them? Okay, so maybe, maybe not. What about fast twitch? I imagine there's a few people who who think that fast twitch are. And then an answer that I don't think is given much uh, weight most of the time is that they might be similarly affected. And so what I want to show you now is what does the data say? All right, so here's a study from a, a group um, from 1999 where they looked at two different human muscles. And one was the masseter, so that's a muscle in the jaw, okay, that helps you to chew. And they characterized that muscle quite thoroughly. They looked at uh, su the superficial anterior region, the superficial posterior region, and then the deep region. And they did uh, gel electrophoresis to look at the different mice and heavy chain isoforms in those different areas. And they compared that to the biceps brachii, so biceps of the, in the in the arm, um, and then looked at this in young adult versus elderly participants. Now, some of you may have been around you know, long enough to realize that back in the day, we used to think that the uh, fast twitch muscle fibers in human muscle were comprised of type 2A and type 2B. Well, now we know better, and it was around 1999, actually, that they discovered that despite the type 2B mice and heavy chain gene being expressed in, in the human genome or being in the human genome, it's not actually expressed at the protein level very, very frequently at all. Um, and so what you're seeing here is FB is actually fast X, okay? But nonetheless, so if we just look at the superficial anterior region, what you can see is that there's pretty substantial increase in going from young adulthood to elderly muscle in the fast isoforms. So this is a muscle that's getting faster with aging, not slower. So that contradicts probably much of what you might see in, in kind of classical review articles. Same sort of thing is seen, is seen in the superficial posterior region of this muscle, where again, it's it's showing a reduction in the, in the slow myosin heavy chain and an increase in the fast myosin heavy chain in the elderly. And in the biceps brachii, you see kind of the opposite, which is more the dogma, uh, which is that um, increase in the slow myosin heavy chain and a reduction in the, in the fast myosin heavy chains with age. So, you know, depending on which muscle you look at, you can actually get a very different picture of what's happening. Now, in the rat literature, it can be even more striking. So what I've chosen here is this is... Uh, from work that we did several years ago now. Uh, we're working with the Fisher 344 Brown Norway F1 hybrid rat. So for those of you who don't know this rat, it's uh, it's a cross of the Fisher 344, which is a pretty common uh, commonly used rat in, in uh, biomedical research. It's a kind of a typical white coat with red eyes. So it's an albino mouse, uh, but they bred it with the Brown Norway, which is actually much more like what you might see if you were out on the streets of New York, for example, after dark. <laughs> um, lots of those brown Norway rats. It's the same rat that carried the plague in Europe. Um, anyway, these are very hardy rats. And so what they've done is they've bred these with the Fisher 344 to generate, and they look at the F1 hybrid of this mating. And these rats have genetic stability from the F344 side, but they have longevity and pathology resistance from the brown Norway side. And for that reason, they become a very popular model in the context of aging research, including research looking at skeletal muscle. So when we look in the in the aging rat here, in this particular study, we're focused on 
the soleus muscle. And so what you can see here is that the abundance of muscle fibers that are expressing pure fast mice and heavy, heavy chain, so that's the MHC fast, is very low in a healthy young adult rat. It's around 2% or less. And in contrast to that, the abundance of muscle fibers that are only expressing slow mice and heavy chain is somewhere on the order of 95%. And the other three to 4% are expressing muscle fibers that have both my uh, slow and mice, slow and fast mice and heavy chain co-expressed at the same time. So that's in the young adult state. But when we go to very old uh, rats, so this, think of a rat that's about on par with an 80 to 85 year old human. So this is well into the advanced fa uh, phase of aging where mobility impairment, et cetera, are really much more common. And what you see in this muscle is the abundance of pure fast uh, mice and heavy chain expressive fibers really doesn't change much, but the abundance of muscle fibers that are uh, ex only expressing the slow mice and heavy chain is reduced by almost half. <laughs> so it's down to about 50%. And what we see in contrast to that is a dramatic increase in the, ex the uh, number of muscle fibers that are expressing both slow and fast mice and heavy chain simultaneously. <clears throat> so if we think about this now in the context of what's happening to these muscle fibers, so this kind of dovetails with what I just showed you from the aging human literature where there are muscles that are becoming faster. So here's a, a more extreme example in, an, in a rodent model of aging. But now what I want you to think about is, I'm sure many of you have, have seen data that suggests that the type two muscle fibers are more vulnerable to atrophy with aging. And so that's something I'm really interested in. And I became very interested in, in particular because when we look at the soleus of these aged rats, when we get to this very advanced age, bearing in mind that this muscle was, you know, 95% pure type one muscle fibers in young adulthood. When we get to this very advanced age, this muscle has lost a, at least a third of its mass. So this is, definitely a muscle that's severely impacted by aging and so and yet it's comprised largely of of type 1 muscle fibers so that presents a real conundrum based upon this idea that type 1 muscle fibers are supposedly resistant to atrophy well they're clearly not in the case of the aging rat soleus so what's going on so we've tried to grapple with this so what i would like you to to propose to you is that these uh, the reduction in the, the abundance of these pure, slow mice and heavy chain expressing uh, muscle fibers, that they are actually the source of these slow and fast mice and heavy chain co-expressing fibers in the very advanced stage. So your options are to either think that these are brand new muscle fibers or that they've they're, they're evolved from the pre-existing uh, uh, slow mice and heavy chain expressing fibers. And I favor the latter. Mainly because if you think about the ability of aged muscle to generate new muscle fibers, it's extremely limited. And so the idea that you could see an increase in, in uh, the abundance of uh, brand new muscle fibers by about 40% is pretty slim. <laughs> uh, particularly when you think about the number of muscle fibers in the soleus is actually going down quite dramatically with aging. So I would surmise that these mice and heavy chain co-expressing fibers were originally the type one muscle fibers, the pure slow mice and heavy chain expressing muscle fibers. And so we can actually learn a little bit about the atrophy behavior of type one muscle fibers by looking at these fibers. So if we just look at the mice and heavy chain uh, fast muscle fibers with aging, they're pretty low abundance in the soleus, but they atrophy a lot. So about 60% smaller in the very advanced age. Now, if you look at the, the pure slow mice and heavy chain expressing fibers, they're only atrophied about 20%. And so if you just stop there, you'd be thinking, okay, the slow fibers have a much more resilient uh, character when it comes to uh, prevention of atrophy with aging. However, if you buy into my argument that these co-expressing fibers, which have increased dramatically with aging, were formerly type 1 muscle fibers, well, look at that. The size of these co-expressing fibers with age compared to the original uh, pure slow mice and heavy chain expressing fibers, it's almost atrophied to the same degree as the pure fast fibers. So I would submit to you 
that some muscle fibers, some slow muscle fibers actually do acquire very substantial atrophy potential in advanced age. Um, and so this idea that slow twitch muscle fibers are resilient from aging, I think just doesn't hold up to real scrutiny. So we need to revisit that. So I'm adding to this, I'm not sure how many of you may have seen this. It's just a, a preprint at this point. But if this paper after peer review uh, is published in a similar form to what we're seeing currently, this is quite a fascinating uh, suggestion. So what these folks have done is they've taken human muscle fibers and it's well and it well, uh, it's, it's about, about 2000 individual muscle fibers. Okay. So pretty intense investigation here. And what they've done is they've characterized the proteome and the transcriptome of these single fibers in relation to the expression of the myosin heavy chains, which is what we usually use to determine the type of a muscle fiber, right? So we would say a type one muscle fiber based on the expression of type one myosin heavy chain, a type two A muscle fiber based upon the expression of the type two A, et cetera. So what they did is they looked at the proteomic and transcriptomic features within these different myosin heavy chain characterized fibers. And much to their surprise, although maybe they weren't surprised. I, I think this surprised a lot of people, maybe not, maybe not these investigators. Uh, but what they found is that there was a lot of heterogeneity in the proteome and the transcriptome, even within fibers that had the same myosin heavy chain classification. And they actually made the, the point that the type 2X muscle fibers, based upon their proteome, they're not distinct from the type 2A muscle fibers. They have a lot of overlap in the proteins uh, with the type 2A muscle fibers beyond the type 2 uh, myosin heavy chain isoform per se. So I think that it's work like this that's really going to kind of further illuminate our, our understanding of what it means to be, you know, a type whatever muscle fiber and uh, and how that might change with aging. And so that's an important concept. So I would say we're going to have to pay attention to that. So just some take home messages related to fiber type is, firstly, I don't believe that there's any uh, substantial evidence that any particular fiber type is immune from aging. I think they all are. We could, you know, argue about some of the nuances that maybe there's some fibers that have a, a slightly greater propensity for atrophy than others. And I think the data would suggest it's the two A fibers that are most vulnerable to atrophy. Uh, if we really want to dig into that, but they all atrophy uh, to quite a substantial degree. So really, we're splitting hairs. I think when we get down to that, um, and. Related to that point is type one fibers can and absolutely do atrophy, but some of this can be obscured by a shifting myosin heavy chain expression. And so really this gets at a concept that I don't think is well dealt with in the literature, which is that the history of a muscle fiber really does matter. And that the uh, identity, if you want, of a muscle fiber, it's not a static property across the lifespan. And I don't think we have a very good handle on that. There are things going on in muscle across the lifespan, like denervation and re that can change that identity of a muscle fiber, certainly influence it in a very meaningful way. And if we don't have a handle on that, I don't think we can have a very good handle on understanding how fibers that are of a different type composition, for example, are affected by aging, because we just don't understand that history. And then related to that point, is that there's a lot more to muscle fiber type than just the myosin heavy chains. And so really, I think we need to pay attention to this area and we're gonna see a lot of evolution and thinking as we go. So how about the mitochondria, right? I was tasked with talking about the mitochondria. We've talked a little bit about fiber type. Let's bring in the mitochondria. So a common hypothesis in the field of aging muscle. And so this has obviously been an area that I'm very invested in. But there are many investigators out there who have a very similar hypothesis, and that is that alterations in mitochondrial function are somehow functionally related to skeletal muscle deterioration with aging. And the big question is how? And so I don't think we have a very good handle on that, but we're starting to, I think, get some leverage. And so I'm hoping by the end of this talk to illuminate a little bit of that and also show you just where I think some of the most important work is going to be done going forward. So before getting into that, I do want to stress that mitochondria do a lot. Uh, and so everybody in here will appreciate that mitochondria are fundamental to energy production. 
Um, for some of you, maybe that's as far as you you thought about mitochondria, um, but others will have been aware that, okay, yes, mitochondria also evolved in generating reactive oxygen species. You know, for many years, that was largely considered exclusively in the context of a, of a negative uh, function, but we now have more nuanced thinking and realize that some ROS production is actually necessary for cellular function uh, That and that there can be excesses. But our understanding of where that tipping point lies is really the area that, that people are investigating now. And then lastly, I want to impress upon you that mitochondria are really the important buffer for cytoplasmic calcium. And there's actually some pretty cool data emerging now showing the importance of mitochondria buffering calcium in skeletal muscle. And that's been an area where I would say we have known a lot less. Um, the role of mitochondria as a calcium buffer in other tissues I think has been a little bit better established, but in skeletal muscle, maybe not, not so much, but that's, I think, starting to shift a bit now. And then as I'll begin to discuss with you uh, towards the latter parts of this talk, uh, the mitochondria seem to be really fundamental to proteolytic activation uh, and perhaps also to inflammation. I'm not really going to get into the inflammation side though today. So some of the key questions we're going to try to grapple with is how does aging affect mitochondrial function and looking at the different types of functions, how it differs between muscles of different contrasting uh, of different uh, fiber type. And then lastly, to deal with how these changes uh, in which particular functions are maybe most meaningful in driving aging muscle phenotypes. I'll tell you a little bit about what we know, but I will preface this by saying that really we know the tiniest <laughs> fraction of things at this point in time. So I wanna start with by saying that when we first started on our journey to kind of begin to think more meaningfully about uh, mitochondrial function changes in aging muscle, uh, we were doing a lot of studies in, in this Fisher 344 Brown Norway rat that I had mentioned to you. And I was very fortunate to be introduced to a PhD student named Martin Picard, who is working with uh, Tanya Tavisalo and Jan Burrell at, at, uh, in Montreal at uh, McGill University and the University of Montreal, respectively. And so they introduced me to Martin and Martin came and spent some time in my lab when I was at the University of Calgary. Um, and that may have had an influence on me moving to McGill after that point, um, seeing and making connections with some of these fantastic uh, people. But th this study was something that Martin really moved forward in a, in a very important way. And so we had already noticed that we were seeing some pretty interesting divergence in terms of the atrophy behavior of different muscles. And it didn't necessarily, uh, you know, revolve around their fiber type proportions. And we, so what we did is we kind of focused on four muscles, two of which were largely fast twitch in their character and two which were largely slow twitch in their character. And um, really we're honing in now on, on what's happening within these muscles and trying to understand how some of the changes that were occurring related to the fiber type. And so I just want to make the point that the adductor longus is a really weird muscle. Uh, so that's a muscle that's on the interior of the thigh. It's an adductor, right? So it helps add the legs together. So it resists the, the leg splaying, if you want. And what you can see here is this muscle is actually hypertrophying by nearly 50% between young adulthood and very advanced age. And that is not a typo. Uh, there's actually been a couple of other groups that have made similar observations. So we're not the only ones to have made this, this observation. It's very robust. Uh, what we think is going on is that this is mainly addition of sarcomeres in, uh, in series. And so we think the muscle is getting stretched, largely because the animal is getting heavier as they get older. Uh, and so there's extra stress on the adductors to try to resist the, the, just the inertia of, of, of gravity of their body mass. And so we think they're adding sarcomeres. So I don't have time to get into too much of that, but I did want to make that point. And the other muscles here, you can see that that we've got a couple of muscles, the EDL and the soleus have very similar atrophy around 20%. Although we can find some data that would suggest that the soleus is actually atrophying a little bit more than that, closer to 30%. And then the gastroc is about a 40% atrophy across this time period. So a range of atrophy, uh, and a range of, of uh, muscle fiber types. So one of the things that we, we do in my lab is we characterize um, mitochondrial function using this preparation that 
some of you will know, I know uh, Chris Perry knows this very well, and he might be laughing at my little dissection skills here in this video. And you can laugh away, Chris, it's okay. I'll forgive you for it. Um, but what we do in, in the lab is we do the vast majority of our studies in these per supponent permeabilized muscle fibers. So we start out with a muscle. In this case, this is a mouse tibialis anterior that's in this video. And I'm dissecting away the deep region, which is comprised more of oxidative muscle fiber types. And so I'm just going to separate that. And then I'm gradually going to make uh, muscle bundles out of this. So while this is happening, I'm just going to describe to you some of the assays that we do. So we'll take these bundles and we'll put them in a, in a respirometer, uh, high resolution respirometer with different substrates. So we can add the muscle fibers, then we can add, in this case, carbohydrate substrates, glutamate, malate. Then we'll add ADP to stimulate respiration further. And the slope of this line here represented in blue is the, is the rate of oxygen consumption by the mitochondria. And then we can add another uh, substrate, succinate. So that's for uh, complex two of the, of the electron transport chain. And that's usually when we'll see a maximal state three respiration. And then we can add cytochrome C to test the integrity of our muscle bundles, make sure that we haven't damaged them. We can then inhibit uh, complex three with antimycin A before we add an artificial electron donor called uh, TMPD so that we can look specifically at the capacity of um, complex four independent of the upstream steps. So that's the respiration side. Then we can also look at the ROS generation by the mitochondria. We can do a very similar protocol to what we've done with the respiration where we can add different substrates. And in this case, what you can see is that we're using an Amplex red probe. And so the production of resoruffin is actually what we're measuring here. Uh, and so that is increasing as the ROS generation is going up. And as I said, we add different substrates. So we're adding glutamate malate, then we'll add succinate. And then usually we'll titrate in different levels of ADP. And then we'll add antimycin in at the very end. And then the last assay that we do is something called the calcium retention capacity. And so I'm gonna talk quite a bit about this in the latter part of the talk. And so what we'll do is we'll have a, a calcium green 5N probe in the cuvette, and then we add our muscle bundles into there. And we do one further step after we do supponent permeabilization. And that is we deplete the muscle fibers of myosin so that the calcium doesn't get stuck there. And so then we put these into our cuvette and we're able to follow the, uh, the amount of calcium that's being taken up by the mitochondria and eventually they'll reach a point where the mitochondria can't hold the, the calcium any further. And they release that calcium back out into the cytoplasm. And so that calcium uptake curve then reverses and we see the calcium increase again. So we can look at the total amount of calcium it takes to get to that point of reversal, as well as the time that it get, takes to get there as indicators of how sensitive the mitochondria are to undergo this process called permeability transition. So let me talk a little bit more about permeability transition uh, in a few more slides here. So let's get to looking at mitochondrial respiration. So this is using those supponent permeabilized muscle fibers that I've just shown you that we generate. And when we look at the four different muscles that I've just described to you that have a, you know different rates of atrophy, what you can see here is that respiration is preserved in all the muscles except the soleus into an advanced stage. And so the solia shows about a 20% reduction, but everything else is looking pretty reasonable. And likewise, if we look at the abundance of mitochondrial subunits, so this, these are representative protein uh, subunits from each of the uh, electron transport chain complexes. And so what we tend to see is that in the fast switch muscle, muscle uh, uh, dominant muscles, so that's the two in the top right here, the EDL and the, ga and the gastroc, those both show uh, a, a tend to increase with aging. And so you might think if you're looking at the respiration now and seeing that there's no change, that the actual intrinsic respiratory capacity of the mitochondria is actually suppressed, okay? And then on the slow twitch side, we're seeing, if anything, a little bit of a reduction. And, and that's only in the soleus where we see representative subunits of complex one and complex four are both reduced. And that kind of mirrors the reduction in state through respiration that I've just shown you here. So these are fairly mild changes, but they're not inconsequential. What about ROS? 
Well, what we tend to see here is a more general increase in ROS production across all the muscles. Now it's kind of borderline significance in the fast muscles, but depending on how you do your stats, if you do just a two-way ANOVA, there is a significant main effect without an interaction for an increase in ROS generation under these state two conditions. So these are the conditions of the mitochondria where the mitochondria are just more idling, all right? So we haven't activated respiration yet by adding ADP. And this tends to be the state where we see the highest ROS generation of the mitochondria. Okay, once we add ADP, the rate of, of uh, ROS generation actually starts to go down, okay? So now let's segue to the mitochondrial permeability transition. And really, this is where I'm going to spend the bulk of the rest of this talk. So the some of you will appreciate that the uh, mitochondrial permeability transition is, is regulated by this permeability transition pore. And so the molecular identity of this pore is, is not fully resolved. But what we think is going on is that the we require at least the uh, ATP synthase and at least one of the uh, adenine nucleotide transporter or ADP ATP uh, carrier isoforms in order for permeability transition to occur. So we may yet still see some further uh, evolution of our thinking about these constituents, but I think you can take these two components as being things that will likely stick as time goes by. And so what, what do we mean by permeability transition? So for the most part, when we talk about permeability transition, we're talking about what we call the high conductance mode. So that's when the pores open for a prolonged period and things happen that are of consequence. So let's talk about this. Calcium is the main stimulus. So calcium gets taken up into the mitochondria by a number of different channels, but arguably one of the more important ones is this voltage dependent anion channel takes calcium into that intermembrane space within the mitochondria. At that point, calcium can be taken up by the mitochondrial calcium uniporter into the mitochondrial matrix. When that happens, we get assembly of the mitochondrial permeability transition pore, which allows dissipation of the uh, mitochondrial membrane potential and release of reactive oxygen species into that space. And with that shift in, in uh, hydrogen ions back into the matrix, that actually causes an osmotic stress that can cause swelling and rupture of the outer mitochondrial membrane to release things like reactive oxygen species and cytochrome C into the cytoplasm. So these are the things that are thought to occur and be of significant consequence when we think about a high conductance mode permeability transition event. So this is quite well established as a pathological mechanism in things like the heart. For example, when somebody has a heart attack and uh, you get a, a transient blockage of blood supply and oxygen to a, a portion of the of the heart muscle, and once that that uh, a clot is resolved, so that you get restoration of flow, we see a big increase in in permeability transition events in the the mitochondria of the heart that are on that distal side of that blockade uh, or that perturbed flow, and that is a major source of cellular damage. To those uh, heart muscle uh, muscle cells, and if you can inhibit permeability transition during that reperfusion phase uh, of following a heart attack, you can actually prevent a lot of the cardiac damage. And so that's really been the main area that's kind of channeled and and uh, uh, promoted a lot of interest in permeability transition as a as an event, and in trying to develop uh, small molecules. Uh, pharmacologically that we can use to manipulate the amount of permeability transition that's going on. But we know a lot less about this event in skeletal muscle than we do in other tissues. So what we can say to this point is that mitochondrial permeability transition, really, it's not an on or off response. Um, we now tend to think of it as more of a continuum. And so you can have very brief flickering, uh, so-called flickering permeability transition events, and these are thought to be really important in the context of calcium signaling and maybe regulation of mitochondrial membrane potential, little flash of, of ROS release and calcium here and there. So more kind of signaling type of events. And then the other side is this kind of more pathological chronic high conductance mode that I've just spoken to you about. Now, how does this fit into aging? 
Well, there's actually quite a bit of literature that is accumulating around permeability transition, and in particular, an increased frequency of permeability transition events as a sig significant driver for aging muscle biology. And so these are just some papers, if you're interested in it. Uh, the one in the middle, they have actually manipulated the frequency of permeability transition events to increase that frequency. And what they find is it actually shortens lifespan and accelerates aging phenotypes. And that's in a, in a worm model uh, of aging C. elegans. So plenty going on in the aging space. And this is something we've been very interested in in the context of aging muscle. And so the question is, is there evidence for permeability transition in aging muscle? And it would be a pretty short talk. We could just stop here if there wasn't. So you probably know that there is. And so I thought it was appropriate given that uh, uh, this is uh, a, a host event by York University and, and the, the former head of the, of the Muscle Research Center there, David Hood, who also invited me to this, to this presentation today. And so this is a, a study that, that his group did back in 2008, where they looked at isolated mitochondria, they isolated subsarcolemmal. So these are the mitochondria that are close to the oxygen source in muscle fibers versus intramyofibular mitochondria. So these are the muscle, uh, the mitochondria that are further away from the oxygen source and muscle wrapped around the myofibrils within the muscle fibers. And they isolated them, they incubated them in uh, cell culture conditions, and they measured the amount of endonuclease G. And so for those of you who don't know, endonuclease G is a protein that has specific functions within the mitochondria. That's normally where it is sequestered, is, is within the mitochondria. But when the permeability transition pore opens, the endonuclease G can get out into the cytoplasm. So what uh, David Hood's group did is they incubated these mitochondria in a cuvette, and they then measured the amount of endonuclease G that was being put out, spewed out into the incubation media. And what they found is that the aged mitochondria are spitting out a lot of endonuclease G. So that's a, a pretty clear indicator that there is more permeability transition events, but it's not the only thing that could be causing that, just for full uh, disclosure. But a few years later, sorry, we did a, a study where we looked at um, gastrocnemius muscle fiber bundles from young versus aged animals. And we found that the amount of calcium that it took to trigger permeability transition, as well as the time that it took to get there was reduced. So these two things are really complementary pieces of data. And they suggest that the mitochondria are more prone to undergo permeability transition. And they are actually undergoing this process based on that endonuclease G release. Okay, so what? Um, we also looked at human muscle. And so these are some studies that we, we took uh, biopsies from the vastus lateralis of, of uh, individuals. We then did the saponin permeabilization and then depleted the myosin to generate the ghost bundles that we use in our calcium retention capacity assay. And then using that calcium green 5N indicator, follow the calcium dynamics. And what we find is that both uh, men and women exhibit a shorter time to permeability transition and a, a lesser amount of calcium is needed to trigger permeability transition in the mitochondria from skeletal muscle with aging. So it's clear that just like in the animal model data that I've shown you, in aging humans, we also see this sensitization. And similarly, if we look within the muscle and do uh, imaging to look at factors that are released from the mitochondria, so remember I showed you that data from the aging rats from David Hood's group, where they looked at endonuclease G, we're looking at a different protein here called apoptosis inducing factor or AIF. That too is normally housed within the mitochondria and it's released during permeability transition. And so what we looked at here is we looked for myonuclei, so nuclei within the dystrophin border of the muscle fibers. And what we found is that there was a pretty substantial abundance of muscle fibers, of myonuclei rather, that had uh, AIF within them. And so that's a pretty clear indication that mitochondria have undergone permeability transition. So just like what we saw in the aging road data, the human data suggests that uh, the mitochondria are more prone to permeability transition and have indeed undergone more permeability transition events. So that really leads us to the question of, well, okay, what is it doing? What does permeability transition mean for muscle? 
And so imagine you've got a muscle here, it releases some of these, these factors. Um, and what is it doing? Does that have a consequence for muscle? So I've highlighted mitochondrial ROS and caspase three here for a very specific reason. And some of you will know that there's actually a lot of history of mitochondrial ROS and caspase three in skeletal muscle, and particularly in the context of muscle atrophy. And so maybe this is telling us something important. So just to give you an example of some of this literature, this is data from uh, my former UF colleague, he's now retired, but Scotty Powers, I sometimes bump into him out in St. Augustine. He's doing well for those of you who know him. Um, at any rate, he had some really nice studies during his career. And this is one of them where they were using uh, a really cool model where they mechanically ventilated uh, rats. And then they looked at various indices of mitochondrial function, and they looked at the muscle fiber cross-sectional area. And then they were using a mitochondrial targeted compound called SS31. And those of you who know anything about this compound will know that it does a lot of different things, uh, including uh, stabilizes cardiolipin, which is a, a protein in the mitochondria. And it also will uh, reduce the amount of reactive oxygen species production by the mitochondria. And it was that latter uh, function of SS31 that, that uh, Scotty's group were particularly interested in. And so what they did is they treated uh, rats with this SS31 compound uh, of rats that were undergoing this mechanical ventilation. And so compared to control uh, sham operated uh, rats, what they found is that the mechanically ventilated uh, rats found a big increase in mitochondrial ROS generation um, in the mechanically ventilated condition, but that could be prevented by this SS31 compound. And when they looked at the muscle fiber composition or sorry, fiber uh, cross-sectional area, what they found is that the type one and the type 2A and the type 2BX muscle fibers all atrophied when the animals were undergoing mechanical ventilation, but that atrophy could be prevented with this mitochondrial ROS quenching compound SS31. So that's just one example of a study that shows the importance of mitochondrial ROS generation to the atrophy that's shown. Now, what about caspase three? There's a lot of data here that I could show you, but I'm just gonna focus on this one one particular study where they looked at uh, caspase three cleavage and how it affected actin. So one of the actin, one of the, the molecules that's part of the actin and myosin cross bridges. And what they found is that when they activated uh, caspase three, it was causing cleavage of actin and created this very specific cleavage frag fragment called a 14 kilodalton actin fragment. So this is quite a bit smaller than the normal intact actin and so they were using that as kind of a fingerprint, if you want, of actin, or sorry, of, of caspase three action. And what they showed in different atrophy conditions is that there was in fact, an increase in this 14 kilodalton actin fragment. Okay, so that's the important part to introduce to you is that increases in ROS and increase in caspase three have both been linked to atrophy in muscle. So what is that all downstream of mitochondrial permeability transition? So what we did in our, in our lab is we looked at, at whether or not if we can trigger permeability transition, what does this do to mitochondrial ROS and what does it do to caspase three activity? And so we do that by using some different compounds. So we use this one compound called BZ423, uh, which promotes permeability transition. And then we looked at another compound, which is an inhibitor of permeability transition called TR002. I often refer to this in the lab for simplicity as true to. And so these compounds have different effects. So BZ423 promotes uh, permeability transition, true to inhibits it. So when we treat single muscle fibers from adult mice with BZ423, we find that it increases mitochondrial ROS generation. And if we uh, use a, a mitochondrial uh, raw scavenger called mitotempo, we can prevent that effect. And likewise, if we inhibit permeability transition using true two, we can prevent that effect. So this shows that permeability transition increases mitochondrial ROS generation. Well, what about caspase three? So this is using what's called a caspase three flicka ends uh, assay, where we get uh, a fluorescence 
in response to caspase three activity. So it's actually measuring caspase three activity. And so when we stimulate permeability transition or activate permeability transition with this BZ423, we get an increase in mitochondrial ROS generation, and we can prevent that with a specific caspase three inhibitor, or again, our MPT inhibiting compound TRUE2. So clearly, uh, permeability transition causes both an increase in ROS and caspase three activity. Okay, does it cause atrophy? Well, if we look at our aging muscle, it's very interesting because we actually see evidence for caspase three activity. So we see an increase in this 14 kilodalton actin fragment that I mentioned to you is something that occurs in response to caspase three activity. Okay, so that could be consistent with an increase in permeability transition. So let's look at how permeability transition relates to vulnerability to atrophy across the four muscles that I've talked to you uh, previously in this talk. So in introducing that, I want to tell you that the amount of calcium that it takes to trigger permeability transition is different across the fiber types. You actually require less calcium for the EDL and the gastroc than you do in the soleus and the adductor longus. Okay. And that's a pretty robust uh, difference. So taking that into account, when we've looked at these four different muscles and the, the time that it takes to get to that permeability transition uh, event, we have now taken into account shifts in the abundance of fast versus slow myosin heavy chain in these muscles using uh, gel electrophoresis SDS page to look at the abundance of the different myosin heavy chain isoforms. And so what you see on the right panel is the time to permeability transition as a function of the a proportion or the percentage of myosin heavy chain fast within these different muscles. So the gastroc and the EDL, their fast myosin heavy chain composition doesn't change a whole lot. There are some changes within the specific isoforms, but the overall abundance of fast doesn't change much. And so it looks like we see a pretty substantial reduction in the time to permeability transition in those muscles with aging. Now the soleus is doing something quite interesting. You remember I talked to you off the top when we were talking about fiber type changes, that the soleus actually sees a pretty substantial increase in fraction of fast mice and heavy chain expression. And so if we take that into account, we actually find that the time to permeability transition in the soleus is quite a bit shorter than it should be given the fast mice and heavy chain uh, proportion. So it looks like the mitochondria are actually sensitized to permeability transition, but only in the three muscles that are atrophying. So that's fascinating. And what's more, if we look for kind of evidence that permeability transition has occurred by looking for these myonuclei that contain this uh, protein that's released during permeability transition, so this is that apoptosis inducing factor that I've spoken to you about before, we see the same thing. Only in the muscles that atrophy, the soleus, EDL, and gastroc, do we see an increase in myonuclei that are positive for this protein that's released during permeability transition. Hmm, okay. So we then thought, all right, let's just see if we induced, chemically induced permeability transition, can we actually make the muscle fibers atrophy? And indeed, that's exactly what we see when we induce permeability transition using this BZ423 that I've spoken to you before. Within 24 hours, we can induce about 20% muscle atrophy, and that can be prevented by treating with this MPT inhibiting compound TRUE2. Now, how does this relate to caspase three and mitochondrial ROS? Well, uh, if we, similar to what we see when we inhibit uh, permeability transition with TRUE2, if we inhibit mitochondrial ROS with a mitochondrial targeted antioxidant called mitotempo or a uh, caspase three inhibitor, and it's got a long name, so I'm not even gonna say it to you, but you can see it there in purple. If we inhibit either of those, of those things, we get prevention of the atrophy. So it looks like, permeability transition in skeletal muscle fibers is stimulating an increase in mitochondrial ROS and caspase three activity, and that it's those two things that are actually causing the atrophy. So uh, that's quite fascinating and maybe suggests uh, why we're seeing this consistent link uh, in the aging muscles. So this is the last couple of slides I'm gonna show you. 
one of the things that we've noticed is that when we probe for a, a glycoprotein called neural cell adhesion molecule, and so this is a protein that's upregulated when a muscle fiber loses its innervation. All right, so it's used quite extensively in the literature as a marker for denervated muscle fibers. And when we probed for the percentage of muscle fibers that had uh, AIF positive myonuclei, so these are muscle fibers that we would say have mitochondria that are undergoing permeability transition or, or have undergone permeability transition, what we find is that uh, there's a pretty high proportion of those fibers that are positive for this denervation response of uh, glycoprotein in both the soleus and the gastroc. So the question that we have is, could permeability transition be actually affecting the muscle end plate in some fashion and actually be causing atrophy? And there's a reason what, that we're thinking along these lines, and it's because previous studies have shown that when you activate caspase 3, you can actually cause dismantling of the acetylcholine receptor cluster at the end plate of individual muscle fibers. So we thought, huh, I wonder if permeability transition could be the link between caspase 3 degradation and the acetylcholine receptor cluster dismantling. So that was what we sought to do here. So we took uh, individual muscle fibers and we labeled them with alpha bungarotoxin that was conjugated to uh, alexafluor 488 so that we could observe the uh, these acetylcholine receptors in real time. Um, and then we uh, stimulated permeability transition with that BZ423. So what I want you folks to look at is this is a single end plate from on a single muscle fiber. And we have now labeled it with, um, acetyl, uh, with the alpha bungarotoxin. And we've now treated this single muscle fiber with BZ423 to induce permeability transition. And so what I'm going to show you is a 12-hour time lapse collapsed down to a few seconds. So what I particularly want you to focus on on this end plate here is the top portion, okay? Because uh, what you'll see is as time elapses here, that beginning at the top of this end plate, now you can start to see removal of the acetylcholine receptors. So that green fluorescence is reducing chronically over time. So this is now, you know, something that we're very interested in. And if we just look at the average data, we find that in response to treating with BZ423, which triggers permeability transition, we see a reduction in the total area that's occupied the acetyl by the acetylcholine receptors. And if we characterize the integrity of this cluster, so you can see from the image that normally on these single muscle fibers, you the acetylcholine receptors kind of have this one contiguous structure, okay? But after we've induced permeability transition, we find that most of them have at least two and some of them have even three and four segments. So they're basically blowing apart this acetylcholine receptor cluster. And that's a phenomenon that's well known uh, in the literature uh, of with people looking at the neuromuscular junction in various contexts, including aging, and it's called fragmentation of that acetylcholine receptor cluster. And so we clearly see that in response to permeability transition. So that really has led us now to question if we can reduce mitochondrial permeability transition in aging muscle, could we slow aging? So to do that, I'm just gonna say to you right now, we don't have any data. <laughs> so maybe I'll get invited back for another webinar one day, who, who knows? Uh, but what we've done is we've crossed these flocked uh, PPIF mice. So PPIF is the gene that encodes for cyclophilin D and we've crossed them with an inducible uh, Cree mouse to ger generate an inducible muscle specific knockout uh, of uh, cyclophilin D. And so the idea is that these mice have a really dramatically elevated amount of calcium that's needed to trigger permeability transition. So maybe we could normalize things with aging and make things better. We'll see. All right. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, sorry for the little technical hiccups at the beginning. And hopefully we have time for a couple of questions. Oh, thank you very much, Russ. This what visuals you put in the presentation. I think I've taken notes, not just on the science, but how to put one together. <laughs> um, and 
that is not your fault at all. I, I'm going to take responsibility on that. Maybe I need to test a few more things with speakers before we start. So sorry about the technical. But thank you very much. Um, everybody in attendance, please uh, post your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat, uh, because I'm monitoring the Q&A part. In fact, we do have some questions already. Um, <clears throat> David Hood said, uh, thank you for your great informative talk. Do you think that endurance training would attenuate uh, mitochondrial permeability transition poor activity in aged muscle, and how would that work? I think that's a fantastic question, and you know I'm, I'm really glad to hear the exercise question. I think that's one of the more important things that we can ask when we think about aging. Is you know all right, well, how does physical activity impact these things? And so there is actually some history. Uh, of physical activity affecting the amount of calcium that it takes to trigger permeability transition. And it does look like it will increase it. Now, to my knowledge, nobody has looked at the effect of exercise in an aging model and how it might impact the amount of calcium that it takes to trigger permeability transition. So I definitely think it's worth looking at, but we don't have an answer to that question right now. Yeah. Yeah. And he asked a follow-up question. What component of the PTP uh, permeability transition port, would you knock out to prove that it was involved in aging? Cyclophilin D, other? Well, I think if, you know, that's what we're going to do is actually knock out cyclophilin D. And the main reason for that is it's the main protein that regulates the amount of calcium that's needed to trigger permeability transition. And it does that through post-translational modification to that cyclophilin D protein. And in the context of aging, there's actually a history here um, of an increase in acetylation of cyclophilin D. And an acetylation of cyclophilin D will, in fact, reduce the amount of calcium that it takes to trigger permeability transition. And so, as far as I know, that hasn't been looked at in skeletal muscle yet, but if I had to put my money anywhere, I would say that we're going to see an increase in acetylation of cyclophilin D in aged muscle. And so, it's probably a culprit. And for that reason, you could take a couple of different strategies. You could just knock out cyclophilin D, or you could upregulate the sirtuins like sirtuin-3 to deacetylate that cyclophilin D and maybe get a beneficial effect. So those are two different strategies I would consider. Right. Interesting. Um, going back to some of the earlier parts of the presentation, you know, great points about mice and heavy chain um, staining versus potentially other ways to define fiber type. So how might we fiber type muscles if not by myosin? I think that's the million dollar question, yeah. right? Um, I think this is something that's just starting to emerge. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of work to be done and a lot of head scratching and, and you know, think tank to, to really distill down to some things that are going to be meaningful, right? It was nice when we could just think about, oh, we just need to express, to look at the expression of one protein and yeah. then we've got something that means something. But I think we're starting to realize that maybe not, right? And so... You know, there's been people like Marcus Bauman, they in the past have characterized other proteins within, you know, myosin heavy chain typed muscle fibers. And one of the things that they've pointed out is, you know, I talked briefly about this, this uh, fiber type grouping phenomenon and these denervation, reinnervation events that are happening with aging. And so what ends up happening is, is let's say that you're a type two muscle fiber that loses its original innervation because that type two motor neuron dies. If it happens to be next door to a type one muscle fiber with a viable innervation, it's likely to get its, its restoration of, of innervation from an axonal sprout from that neighboring kind of slow motor unit. And so that type two muscle fiber will then at least partially convert to a type one muscle fiber. And so what um, Marcus's group have done is they've probed for a circa isoform within those type one muscle fibers. And what they find with aging is the grouped type muscle, type one muscle fibers, which are the ones that have probably been affected by this denervation reinnervation event, they actually express the fast circa one uh, at a higher rate than you would expect. I mean, normally a type type one muscle fiber shouldn't have circa one in it; it should have circa two a. Uh, so, you know, those are some of the things that I think people are going to start to look at. Yeah. But I couldn't honestly tell you where the where it's going to lie yeah. with the winners but yeah. it's going to get complicated before it gets simple the calcium aspect of fibers yeah and and perhaps building on the exercise uh themed questions is one thing that 
kind of comes to mind is a use disuse as we age. Um, how much of the sarcopenia is due to disuse? And I, and obviously that sparks an obvious idea at the whole body level that the mice aren't moving enough and people aren't moving enough. Um, but more specifically, do you think under that theme that non-postural muscles, muscles other than the soleus are going to atrophy to a greater degree than the soleus is atrophy? Well, again, great question. Um, yeah. And the answer to that is sometimes because okay. yes, there, there can be muscles that are, that are, uh, um, you know, maybe exhibit a greater amount of disuse and they atrophy more, but the soleus is a weird one. I don't think we have enough data in humans to say one way or the other compared to say right. vastus or astron. But in the rodents, we can say this, you know, it's a, it's highly used and it's certainly not uh, immune to atrophy. It atrophies a lot. Yep. Yep. Um, and it sees a ton of that, of denervation as well. Right. Um, so it's, it's pretty complicated to kind of unravel those things. I think in general, uh, definitely being active is better. You know, if yep. you look at, physically active populations, they seem to have obviously better retention of muscle mass and function. And part of it seems to be actually related to a better re capacity. So they can recapture their denervated muscle fibers with higher fidelity. Okay. At the innervation, yeah. And yet again, the innervation idea being a key mechanism here to go after. Yeah. So can I just add to that though? I didn't have a chance to get into it, but you know, there's lots of mitochondria and motor neurons too. Yeah, um, and there's some cool data from a study in 2013 where they did electron microscopy of uh, the motor neuron terminals to look at the mitochondria, and the mitochondria in the aged uh, muscles, the in the motor in the motor neuron terminals, were showing evidence of having undergone permeability transition. Mm -hmm. So it's happening there too. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a target that I think could have pleiotropic effects particularly if you target it systemically rather than just in one compartment. Right. So the Scott Power study with the SS31 mitochondrial targeted antioxidant that prevented um, reductions cross-sectional area, how much of that was due to the mitochondria and fiber versus presynaptic and the motor neuron preventing denervation, preventing the atrophy? Yeah. That would be yeah, a really don't... Good follow up study. Sure. Russ, thank you so much for joining us. This was really informative and obviously lots and lots of interesting questions. And uh, just wanted to thank you very much for joining us. It was my pleasure. Thanks to you and Dave. Awesome, awesome. So I'm gonna stop the recording now.